Um, on the programme, it's David Gibson who's going to be speaking today, but I'm his replacement, I think, or, or an alternative, perhaps. I've, I've changed the sort of approach to the talk um, from my perspective as the, the lead archaeologist of the Musk Farm investigations. And I, I want to start with a, a sense of context or circumstance of the project, um, both in terms of in the past, but also in terms of us going to excavate the site in the first place. And my first slide really is a, a sense of the opposite of global, I suppose, is, is this idea of, of obscurance, this idea of a landscape that is, is characterised by the fact that it's buried by metres of sediment. And it's, it's a, a, site, uh, a landscape that has very little development, and apart from its sort of edges or fringes, is a landscape that has um, very little in the way of investigation. And it's that obscurance, I suppose, that, that is where I began in sort of 2004, working on the Musk Farm landscape. So going back to then, the sense that we were there as a, as a commercial unit looking at a landscape that was going to be developed for brick making, for uh, the, the extraction of clay. And our first approach was to, to go across those metres of sediment and sink a series of test pits um, and try and characterise the paleo landscape. And it was, it was pretty sort of lonely and quite bleak. And we didn't find much in the way of artefacts, but we did find a lot to do with the, the depth of the Holocene sequence of the Fenland Basin and a real sense of, of the sort of paleotopography and, and about the, the potential of the sort of archaeological landscape that was buried within those deposits. But it was also a sense of sort of pinpricks of punching holes in that sediment and it was filling up with water and, and sections were collapsing and things like that. I can contrast that with... 2016, when we were digging the, the Musk Farm platform, in the sense that the, the world came to us, the, the world suddenly was interested in, in what it was we were doing in that landscape. And this is the same sediment, but with sort of two metres of, of sediment removed prior to us excavating. We built a, a big white shed in a, in a big hole and excavated part of a paleo channel. And suddenly we had local, national and international press, television, radio coming to site and, and were interested in, in this archaeology. So there's that contrast, I suppose, between what we were doing as a sort of a local unit in a, in a local environment for a, a local de development and suddenly it becoming an international importance. To the point where we were being interviewed by The New Yorker and The, the Washington Post and, and CNN and, and appearing on... Radio 6 Live and things like that. So the sort of sense of the, the, the impact that the archaeology had on us as, as well as on, on the world. And it, part of that, I think, came out of the sense that it, it got labelled the, the Britain's Pompeii and it sort of created this sort of um, expectation, I suppose, about what it was that we were excavating, something that we tried to sort of balance with our own social media through the Facebook and, and Twitter and, and that sense of trying to bring the archaeology to the world and that sense of, of trying to get across the, the excitement but also the sort of interpretive possibilities and things. And, and our, own, our own social outreach, we, we know that we've sort of reached these 7 million people, that we have visitors from every continent of the world and things. So it had that sort of global connection just made through the excavation itself. But equally, we were aware of, of, our, of our locality and that sense of our relationship to, to, to local groups and societies and, and councillors and consultants and, and schools and things. And that sense of, of the sort of parochial situation that we were in, in the sense of trying to get to understand a, a, a landscape, a, a, a site, a context. So... The title I've given this presentation is The Must Farm Pile Dwelling, Parochial and Universal. And these might be seen as sort of negative terms, but I've actually seen them as very positive in the sense that I, I think that my understanding of this is that we all learn from the scrutiny of the close at hand, this idea of all that time we've spent in that landscape and coming to understand its context and articulating that archaeology has brought about a, a universal interest, a global interest and things. But it's something that's come from from us not moving and, and us not about the sort of sense of being good archaeologists and developing our, our, our methodology within, within the same space and that being afforded that because of the industry that was basically developing that landscape, a brick pit, a, a very large hole and a very deep landscape. But equally that sense then of, 
us getting to grips with that landscape was the fact that we were able to go deep because of the very nature of the development that, that we were involved in. So context of that depth then is, is this is Eastern England, this is Fenland, uh, this is a, a LIDAR image, this is topography, this gives you a sense of of relief, I suppose, in the sense that the, the white area in the, the, the lower half of the Fenland Basin is the Cambridgeshire Fens, and it sits at the same height as the, the North Sea you can see in the wash. It sits at sea level. So that's where we begin. And if we go in closer on that image, the big blue tops are the Whittlesea Brick Pits. That's our, our aperture on those, those deep landscapes. But what this image also shows through its topography is the sense of an emerging landscape, a prehistoric landscape. And those little dendritic patterns, those sort of lines running through our Bronze Age paleo channels and that's been where we've been excavating um, at Moss Farm and the focus of our excavation. And this is where the context of our, our investigation changes so rather than looking through little sort of pinpricks and things we're able through the quarry to actually explore huge depths over breadth as well as depth and this idea that we're able to articulate the whole of the Holocene. So this sediment sequence here, the two guys at the bottom are looking at a Mesolithic buried soil, but the, the big black smile towards the top is a, is a later Bronze Age paleo channel. So this sense that we're able to articulate a space and, and explore it at, at many different levels. So the Musk Farm pile dwelling represents one facet of a, a much more sort of complex story. Um, and a sense also, I suppose, of this idea that, that depth is being played out both in terms of our, of our knowledge but also in terms of their stratigraphy. So actually if I just go, go back one, the, the big smile then, the big pedal channel on, the, on the, the right hand side there is, is the sort of focus of our investigation and we first explored it in 2009 and started to find sort of bits of wood that had some sort of tool marks on it and things. Um, occasional bits of metalwork and that. And then in 2010, we started finding fish traps sitting along its base. And we were able to give the channel a chronology of about 1600 through to about 100 BC. And it's a channel that is, is sluggish and slow forming, and therefore it tends to preserve rather than erode or, or, or destroy things. So we found about 28 of these fish traps lining the base of the channel, so dating to the Middle Bronze Age. And then in turn we found a whole series of, of log boats um, dating from the base of the channel right through to the sort of towards the, the upper end of the, the middle, so sort of later Iron Age, um, made of oak and, and lime, and, and all perfectly preserved. And in, in dispersed with that, we also found metalworks. We're finding sort of bronze swords and, and, and Iron Age swords and, and various sort of implements and things. And this started to, sort of, I suppose, brought the world to our project in the first place. We started to get on things like the One Show and things like that. And, and there was a sense that there was a, something exciting in this landscape. And, and there was this sense that we had this sort of, I don't know, armada of, of Bronze Age log boats turning up within, within the fens. The context of our, of our excavation at the platform, you can see this is, this is the channel that we excavated with the, the fish traps and the log boats and the fish weirs and the metalwork. And this is the context of the Musk Farm timber platform. Um, it was first found in, in 1999 by a local archaeologist walking along the edge of an old quarry pit and seeing some bits of wood sticking out the side. We evaluated it in 2006 and demonstrated that it was Bronze Age in date and that there was pottery involved in things. And in 2015, in the sort of late summer, we went back to excavate it in its entirety. Not that one. Um, we put up a big shed over the, the, the excavation and this is the story of, of the site. Um, you can see the sort of the methodology involved in this. It's a lot of sort of dangling from, from planks and things and removing the, the river sediment in order to expose the, the structural elements of the settlement itself. And we were able to generate this plan. So the, the big white triangle in effect is our building. It's 25 by 45 metres. And you can see the wood mass that we expose within the channel itself. The channel runs across this, this image. And it's in effect, it's a, a palisade surrounding a whole series of structures. And the structures are circular, and you can see them sort of emerging from that sort of mass by the, the roof fans. You can see these sort of fans of round houses about eight metres in diameter. And the majority of the horizontal timbers are charred from, from being burnt, being caught in a fire and almost all of the vertical timbers are being preserved through waterlogging. So we know that this is a settlement that was built above a watercourse that burnt down. 
So for the purposes of today, I'm going to focus on one of those structures, which is, is structure one. And you can see that, again, that roof fan, the, the fanning round of the, the, the roof rafters. You can also see the uprights, and you can see the palisade running along one side, and then you can see that sort of blue ring of ten posts forming the outer ring of the roundhouse, and the green ring forming the inner, cent inner circle. And then on top of that, you can see the roof rafters forming that fan. And if I take away the photograph, you get a sense of that, that relationship. So we went there expecting to find some material culture associated with some kind of settlement. We actually found intact structures with the roof still on. And our excitement was, is what was going to happen when we took the roof off and went inside the buildings. Equally at the same time, our dental chronologist, Ian Tyres, when he started looking at the, the tree rings from the palisade and from the structures, was able to recognise that the, all the trees were felled in the same winter. Because of the lack of rings, we weren't able to say what winter that was, but we, we know that basically the settlement went up as one. So we have a year zero, um, sometime probably in the 9th century BC. He was also able to demonstrate that from the charring on the roof rafters as these buildings were burnt down, was that the wood was still green when the settlement was, was destroyed. So he said to us, if it takes 12 months for oak to season, then our settlement went up, and within 12 months it was burnt down. So when we took the roof off the buildings, we started finding the sort of, the, the sort of debris of these collapsed structures in the river sediment itself. So we found elements of furniture and all the material culture. And that's what I'm going to give you now, really, is a sense of the, the richness and the diversity of, of that material. You can see we've got sort of architectural elements. And the other thing to say is that that, that brevity, that, that, that short-termness of this settlement was reflected in, in the stratigraphy. So, at the base of this section, we've got channel deposits, and that sort of silty layer across the top is also channel deposits. And in that 15 centimetres interceding is, is basically the debris of this structure falling down into the channel and being preserved. So that, that is the, the story of, of the, the assemblage. You can see a, a pot sticking out the side there, but also lumps of clay and thatch and turf and things like that. Outside of the buildings, we were finding butch of remains of red deer and wild boar and, and, um, and roe deer and broken pots and things. And these were sort of formative middens forming around the outside. And none of this material culture was burnt, so it was forming during the lifetime of the settlement. Whereas inside the structures, we're finding articulated or semi-articulated three to six month year old lambs. And we were even finding carbonised lamb droppings in, inside the buildings as well. So you've got this sense here of a, a difference between inside and outside. And if we focus on the inside of the structures, there was the real sense of a complete inventory of, of material culture. So we've got pots and wooden vessels. We've got over 180 wooden artefacts um, from across the site. And they're made up of things like wooden buckets, platters, bowls, spatulas, spoons, paddles, um, uh, cloth beaters and things like that. Little wooden boxes. Um, and even to our surprise, given the fact that we're in the fens in a river, we've even found um, a complete wooden wheel and parts of a second wheel as well. And then inside the structures as well was a, a full set of pots, everything from tiny little finger bowls, large storage vessels, and even to the point where we thought we were digging one large storage vessel, we took the sides away from that, found a medium-sized one inside that, and took away that and found a small one inside that. And these are unused, these are brand new. This is the, the sort of John Lewis wedding set, I suppose, in the, in the context of the site. And it's this sense that we were starting to find in this sort of sluggish channel, this, in this sort, of, this sort of ash rain of this burning down settlement, the sort of complete sets of the sort of the household um, material of a, of a late Bronze Age settlement. And you get an idea of that just in the sense of not only in terms of the range of vessel sizes but also in the uniformity of form. So Matt Brudenell, our pottery specialist, is saying that he believes it's every likelihood that these pots were made by the same potter. So this, this sort of brevity is starting to give us some sort of clarity, I suppose, of, of a, a coherent sort of lifetime assemblage. Um, as well as the sort of material richness, there were objects of that were sort of slightly cliched. So the same way that our buildings were circular, they looked like Bronze Age roundhouses you'd find on any dry land site and things. We're also finding things like saddle querns within individual houses, and it turned out to be sort of one saddle quern per household. 
um, and things like flint saddle coins as well as stone ones. And then perhaps things that are a bit more exotic, I suppose, in terms of the, the range of things, the, we're finding sort of clusters of glass, amber and stone and jet beads, sort of composite necklaces. And Julian Henderson, who's been looking at the glass from here, is suggesting that the, the plant ash involved in their production is, is likely to be coming from the sort of, sort of Mediterranean, probably somewhere like sort of northern Turkey or Syria or something like that. So you get a sense of that connection. He's also saying that these are 9th century beads and our society is 9th century, so there is that sense that they are in currency, they're not, they're not sort of curated objects and things. You get a sense of the fire affecting this amber bead, you get the sort of burning down one side. And just a close up of one of the glass beads. And then perhaps in terms of the, the dynamics of the fire, one of the surprising things was the, the sheer quantity of, of textiles. Um, textiles being exclusively made of, of plant fibres, so everything from these tiny little uh, bobbins with um, spun thread wound around them. Get a sense of detail. So we've got things like nettle and, and um, flax and, and lime bast are the predominant materials. Little bundles of threads. We've got string bags, um, and then these really finely woven textiles caught up in, the, in the, the matrix as well. And what Susanna Harris and Margarita Gleber are saying, basically the finest examples of textiles I've ever found in this country, but also equivalent to anything found in, say, like Swiss Lake villages and, and sites of, uh, like that. Um, weft twining. And perhaps more importantly, in terms of the, the sort of context of the textiles, is that we've got evidence of their production happening actually on the site as well. So we've got cloth beaters, these look like the sort of earliest examples of cricket bats found in the UK but in fact they are um, and, we, and we pretty much have one of these per household um, and then also we've got 35 of these plant fibre bundles where the, the fibres have yet to be spun so they're, they're in the preparation of, of being made into textiles spindle whorls loom weights and then again, in this sort of building inventory, I suppose, of these, of these individual structures and things was the sheer amount of bronze metalwork. And predominantly made of tools as opposed to weapons, but things like this bill hook, sickles, axes. You feel like I could just stand here and just press buttons and just <laughs> sort of Bronze Age pawn or something. It's, um, the, and also we were finding wooden buckets with scrap metal inside of them as well, so the sense of sort of formative hordes or the, sort of, the whole sort of process of what was going on in sort of daily life within this, within this Bronze Age settlement. So broken up swords being part of that, that horde collection. And there's also a contrast as well in the sense that we were finding lots of burnt objects associated with uh, the, the superstructure of the settlement prior to it basically coming down into the river context, but also objects that had been deposited before the settlement burnt down. So we've got an axe haft at the top, and then we've got an axe haft at the bottom that's not been burnt with the axe still attached, and that was beneath the centre of, of Roundhouse One. So our, our, our understanding is, is that from, from the sort of faunal assemblage and the, the plant remains and things, is that, that despite their watery context, these are actually a, a, a sort of people that were still thriving on a terrestrial economy. So our, our full assemblage was dominated by boar and deer and, and sheep and cow. Um, our plant remains were barley and, and wheat and things. Um, the wood that was used in the construction of the settlement was things like oak and ash. Um, so it's a real sense that despite their watery context, their relationship was still much, very much to the, the adjacent dry land. Also, our understanding is, is that, that Although we don't have a date for the year zero yet, there's every indication that the, the duration was very short term, and so therefore it sort of it sort of captured this moment and given us for for the first time perhaps a, a, what we might call a, a, a synchronous assemblage. So rather than us thinking about closed assemblages, what we might find in a pit or something like that, and trying to say that this is what was in currency together, you've got a real sense here that these objects are all or coincident or, or contemporary. Our, our issue, I suppose, is that we've got a sort of disjunction here. We've got what was caught in the conflagration and then what was already being formed in that short term of the settlement. And it's about us now trying to bring those two stories back together. But equally, in our understanding of the dynamics of the river, is that, that within the context of those structures, we're actually starting to look at sort of spatial syntax, this idea about what was going on inside individual structures and where things were placed. So I think what we did was that we created our own headlines. We, we, 
we got away from Britain's Pompeii and things, we actually generated a story that attracted a different audience to our site. So we were talking about this idea that we had this sort of every day, but we had it in its entirety. We had complete households and things. And this sense that we were looking at perhaps this sort of what the Bronze Age looked like elsewhere, but in this, in this preserved condition. And consequently, we started to get international visitors. So we were getting academics from everywhere, from Japan to Minnesota to, to Holland, University of Leiden, uh, University of Vienna and things. And it was, a, it was a whole new sort of story for us in terms of, of those connections that we were starting to make. Um, we had departments coming from, from both Britain and, and overseas in that sense that we were starting to meet researchers that were specialists in some of the materials that we were finding in that sense of, of being able to make those connections across the channel. And it's also spawned, um, for me, I'm, I'm getting sort of invitations now to, to go to all sorts of exotic places to talk about this project and, and, and share the story, but also to, get, meet, to meet people that dig pile dwellings or, or dig salt mines where the preservations are equivalent to what we're excavating. So it's generating this whole new sort of sense of, of what the Bronze Age was in the fence. So that sense of the parochial now is now giving me this sense of the, the connection of a, of a broader context, and a context perhaps that the people that were living in these settlements also knew themselves. So just a sort of example of some of the sort of international conferences and things that have been going to, um, and also some of the people that came to site or people that have been in conversation with since, and that sense of really that sort of, from a, from a small hole in the fence, it suddenly become the sense of a, of, a, of a landscape that has a, has a greater connection. And equally, we're now working with, with projects that are looking at that sort of, trying to link East Anglia with a sort of global perspective and trying to get specialists and, and, and collaborations of, of, of our archaeology with, with abroad and things. And this is an example with the St. Breeze Institute, but equally with visitors from NRAP, um, with Beno being involved in a sort of round table to talk about our landscape in relationship with landscapes on, in Belgium and Holland and northern France on either side of the English Channel. So it's that sort of connections that are, that are being made. So I'll go back to that sense of the beginning, I suppose, so the, the idea of the sort of focus that's been put on our project, but the opportunity that it's given us as, as archaeologists working in that landscape. And also that sense that we're not leaving it, we're, the, the development still continues and we will still be exploring that space. So I feel like what I presented to you today is, is not the end of something, but is the beginning of a, of a, of a story that will, will build and, and present a, a, a sense of what was going on in that obscure, deep Fenland Basin. Thank you very much.